All right, thank you. So we're back, uh, and I'm happy to introduce Richard Howitt from the University of California, Davis. Thank you, Steve. Is this microphone correct? It is. Okay. Um, I'm continuing the, the cheerful topic of, um, of uh, contaminated water and large quantities of money uh, to talk about the agricultural effects. And we were just saying over the coffee break that this, this was one of, the, one of the several unexpected and interesting outcomes of this study because when we started it, we sort of both knew, oh, of course, everyone, everyone knew quality is going to be affected by this and by the possible different solutions to, to the problem of the delta. But we had no idea of the magnitude of the economic importance, both, as we've just seen, tremendous economic importance to the urban sector. And now I'm going to talk about uh, the effect on the agricultural sector and how we estimated it. So, and, and then the, the other thing is, um, when you're thinking about moving 4.9 million acre feet of water south to agricultural closed basin irrigation or urban use. Obviously, quality is an extremely valuable economic component. And, and I wonder what it went into the minds. I suspect it was a political decision as to why you would take really nice quality Sacramento water, say 100 parts per million, and you've got to move it south. So first of all, you put it into a place to move it 40 miles, you busily mix it with seawater to raise the salinity up to 300 parts per million before shipping it south. Huh? Um, and, and so fundamentally, that's the current system. Remember, you want clean water south, so you deliberately, or by mistake, contaminate it and then ship it south. So let's look at the costs of this action, since it seems to be somewhat irrational. Um, and this is the costs on the San Joaquin Valley. And I'm just going to give a quick introduction, and without going into all the, the stories about Mesopotamia, Nile Delta, and the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, um, some of them slightly older than others um, in terms of irrigated agriculture. But one thing we absolutely know, in terms of irrigated agriculture, we are in the evapotranspiration business. That's what we're in. And if we're in the evapotranspiration business, we only evapotranspire water and the residuals stay behind. And so the, this has bedeviled irrigated societies for the past 4,000 years, um, certainly. And um, we, we need to take serious thinking about this if we're going to have a steady state agricultural urban economy and society in the Central Valley. When we first did the first um, effects of salinity on the delta, we built a, a delta salinity model in the first PPIC report. And I finished an um, a ongoing report which is coming out um, for the State Water Resources Control Board on the long-term impacts of increased salinity in the Central Valley economic impacts. And one, and one of the main conclusions we came to at the end of this report is that, um, surprisingly enough, we would say, don't give any more money to economists, give it to hydrogeologists, because we really don't know enough about the rate of salinity accumulation, its spatial variability, its dynamics, and its impacts from a strictly physical sense in the valley uh, to be accurate. But given that, we'll, we'll take the evidence we've got. Um, and so we're, we're looking at how agricultural yields are reduced, how the reduction in those yields tilts the cropping pattern away from pro more profitable fruit, nuts, and vegetable crops towards more resilient crops. Uh, because, of course, ironically the, and expected, the, cost, the crops that really make money are the ones that are most sensitive to salt. Secondly, um, how do, where does the salt go? How much goes into the deep aquifer to permanently degrade this future aquifer pumping capacity? And how much accumulates uh, perched above the Corcoran clay layer to form saline, um, perched saline groundwater, which further then reduces cropping patterns? We're going to measure the economic impacts by employment, income, and total output. 
So um, this is our first piece of information that we get from the um, Department of Water Resources and um, the Bureau of Reclamation. And basically, this is the extent in the central, southern Central Valley of perched groundwater, what they call saline-affected areas. Sorry, I'm going to go back. Uh, saline-affected areas. And these, these are the uh, micro siemens per centimeter salinity, and these are the areas. And so we can see that we've got um, a very large area which is salt-affected. And what we did to do this, we've superimposed these on a series of economic modeling zones, which are called CVPM regions. And these are, are linked by water, water district, microclimate, and um, uh, administrative county boundaries, although they do cut across county boundaries. And so this is our, our economic model runs on these districts. And we try and reproduce, calibrate it to pass production patterns. The first thing we have to do is we're going to have to use GIS to break these down and find out what's the degree of salinity in, in which regions. And so um, the State Water Resources Control Board study, picked a fit, they picked a time of 2030, and they said, if we don't take any action on salinity in Central Valley, what will the situation be by 2030? And we looked at several different effects. There's the direct crop effect. There's the indirect crop effect of the changing crop mix on the processing industry. And then there's the cost to the processing industry of the increased salinity from their groundwater water sources. There is a cost on our confined animal industry. Remember, um, people who worry about population say, a million people moving into the, into the Central Valley and the impacts, forget that in bovine form, they're already there. There's 1.5 million cows. And, and the solid waste ratio, I'm told by my friends who are interested in, in this solid waste disposal, <laughs> runs about one to, well, 1 to 10 ratio of us to a cow. And so we've already got 15 million people there in cow form plus all the other poultry and, 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 and other animal operations. It is, it, is, it is, of course, an extremely profitable major problem, the source of money. However, it turns out that the economical way of removing solid waste at the end of an animal operation really is land application. And depending on how stringent you are about the steady state nature of that, Ideally, you would want to see the plant material grown would actually incorporate the phosphorus and the nitrogen, not the salt, the phosphorus and the nitrogen from the solid waste, and have that removed in some way or recycled um, to have true disposal. So what we find is that the economic rate limiting variable on future animal operations is the degree to which the land will be available to really remove these nutrients, and the acceptance rate of farmers to, to have that land. And this acceptance rate is really important, as we've seen if you dial back a year ago with the scares about E. coli contamination in spinach and spinach and, and, and other inputs, that this is, this is a very tricky balance for people producing a mixed farm with a combination of field crops and vegetable crops. Um, They've got to think about the public health uh, aspects of this. And then finally, we've got some non-market costs and benefits, which we surveyed people about. But let's go back to f trying to work out what the salt balance in the valley looks like. And first of all, um, we've got the effect of this on yield reductions. And we're using Van Genuchten and Hoffman's um, fundamental um, article on yield reduction. And it looks like this. These are what we call VG curves, and you can see they work on the proportional yield reduction as a function of the C50, which you can think of that as an LD50 or something. It's, it's the salinity in the Vados root zone that reduces the yield by 50%. So it's the ratio of C, the actual concentration, to the C50. And that's what's on the bottom axis, 
let me point here for the webcam people. And likewise, this is the relative yield reduction. So we start off with, with a root zone that's absolutely pristine, and we get whatever the yield reduction yield is in that region. And then as we increase the salt, depending on this parameter rho, and here's some different curves for different rho values, and we're currently estimating them, we get this, we slide down this yield reduction. Initially, no effect. And then depending on the row, you either get a gradual effect with a, with a low row or a very rapid fall off with a high row. And basically, this would, this would be where alfalfa and cotton is, and this would be where lettuce is. Um, and so um, this is uh, now we have one other really difficult um, complication, and that is that if you remember back to that map, those, that perched salt water is about two meters below the root zone in many places. Some places a little bit closer, some places further away. But it's not directly in the root zone, and this is directly in the root zone. And so we applied a factor, uh, and we lowered the impact by 50 percent to account for that difference, because the several actions farmers can take to offset salt both in their water and in the root zone. The first one, of course, is leaching, and then there's um, a switch in irrigation technology and a switch in, in irrigation methods. We are doing some additional research, which is not finished yet, in trying to get an empirical estimate of how, how effective that, that behavioral um, response to salinity is to, to offset it. Um, and I'll, I can talk more about that later. But this is, this is a, a, a major assumption in the study. And this is the sort of information we have. We have the DWR land use um, crops here. So we have a land use type, and then we GIS our salinity impact on top of that. And so for each field, by creaging it, we have a centroid. And for, actually, for each field, we have a cross-section. We know the soil type, the, the salinity level, and the crop grown. And then by grouping these, we can draw the inference of how the farmer did respond to, to, in his cropping pattern, to salinity changes, and then how they will respond to increases in salinity. So this is how we get the base response. And now let's move on and look at how we think other people have thought that salinity might change. Uh, what we're doing, and this is a very, very, and please don't ask me the engineering basis of this, but this is a very, very crude, um, uh, what you call, might call, Tupperware hydrology, um, in as much that you regard this as a, as a basin with sloping sides, and you keep pouring additional accumulation of saline water in there. What regions of salinity will increase the most? And of course, it is the outside regions which will increase most in these areas. And so we took that GIS area, and we took some extrapolation rates, weighted them by these factors, and you'll see that the most concentrated salts areas we actually didn't increase at all, and, the, and, and we increased them in inverse proportion to their concentration. Think of it as, and if you look at the Corcoran clay layer pictures, you'll see it's got a sort of a, a gentle slope bowl. Um, and having done that, we then need to get the rate of change. Now, um, Garrett Shoups did a PhD in Davis in which he published in 2004. And in it, he took half a million acres of salt-affected area in the valley, only half a million. Uh, it represents about 50 percent of, of the acreage affected. And he plotted the rate of change of the salt-affected pixels over time. So he's got these, and it really starts to kick in in the 70s. So we've really got about 30 years and we threw in these other ones out here and did a regression on them, and you can get an approximate regression, and it runs at 0.5 percent per year rate of increase. Now, Shoups and Hopman's also um, published a paper in the Procedures of the National Academy in which they looked at this half million acres and did a complete balance on it. 
And if we look to the right-hand side, it's just very fuzzy because I'm afraid we just grabbed a PDF and, and, and scanned it. But this is the total salt function running from 1940 to 2000. And if we look at this rate of change, we'll see that this is running at approximately half a million tons per year. Half a million tons per year, net accumulation of salt. The third study we found, and here's the curious thing. This is a major rate limiting variable to the steady state agriculture, and yet there's only three studies on it. Um, was done, one done by Jerry Orlob um, a little bit earlier in, in 91, and he, he uh, estimates, I'm trying to find, uh, here we go, he estimates that uh, it runs, uh, again, this, this, this figure of, of half a million tons a year net accumulation. Now, we're well aware that much of the, the shallow groundwater is stimulated by salt movement out of certain marine layers due to leaching and accumulation elsewhere. At the minute, we're looking at net imports because that's what's going to be affected by a peripheral canal. So we, we, we used all these to come up with some effects. And the question is, um, we've got the trends, and then we change that cropping mix with our cropping model and say, if the area of field crops changes, how will that put restrictions on the confined animal operations? And so we have two sources of money, one from crops directly and one indirectly from confined animal operations. And we parameterize these over a range of, of uh, increase in salinity over our time horizon. So we're taking a 25-year time horizon, and we can go from 3% to 13%. Now, remember, that Shoup's mean regression puts us at about 12 to 13 percent. And we then put them into two cost functions. And so we've got the percent of saline land, saline affected land increase down here and here. And here we've got losses in millions of dollars. Picking a figure that's most likely to to extrapolate the past rate of increase from Shoup's and Orlob's and Hopman's studies, save approximately 12 percent over the next 25 years, we're looking at an annual cost will increase, the annual cost will increase to somewhere about 180 million for crops per year and somewhere in, uh, around 140 million for animal operations. So we're looking at a total cost running at 320, approximately $320 million a year if we do nothing and let this accumulate. Um, how, how does this map in? Now, we can do it in two ways. So we, if we take 20 years, and, and again, one of, the, one of the fun things about working with my colleagues here is the interdisciplinary thing. And we, we were sitting around the table and, and, and saying, well, what's the significance of this? Supposing we put in a canal and we start diverting water at hood at 100 parts per million instead of at the pumping plants at 300 parts per million, well, well how much salt will we, will we not? And, 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 and Bill uh, Fleena said, I can do that. He says that's a lot. It's very nice. <laughs> and, 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 and literally the next time we had a meeting, the next week he came back with some some, some – really fabulous stuff, which I'll show you. Um, so we've got two different indexes here. You can either measure this uh, in total tons of salt. And remember, Schoops and Orlob think there's about 500,000 tons a year going in, which is costing us a little, would cost us a little bit short of 400 million. Or you could say we move 3.7 million acre feet of water into the valley from the delta. And you can plot this on this scale, which is a fun one, because this is plotted on the, P, the parts per million, or, or decisiemens per milliliter, um, of this 3.7, because we can map 3.7. It turns out if you move 3.7 million at 300 parts per million, which we pretty much know, guess what you get? You get 500,000 tons a year. 
And so what you can do is by you can map if the canal can meet existing uh, requirements, you can map this into tons, and then you can map the tons into money. And so for supposing you could you, you had the same operation, but you were diverting 100 parts per million instead of 300, you would, you would have the difference between 400 million and approximately 110 million. Hey, wait a minute. All of a sudden, this is third of a billion. This is starting to get not real money by Washington standards, but non-trivial. So let's follow this through. You can also think of it, even if you don't like money, you can think of it as a time shift of buying time to stay in the same steady state. So let's look at the, the, the sort of um, the, the Doctor Who type time shift stuff here. And um, we, can, we can run these, still, the, the, these two cost functions for animals and crops. And this is, the, this is the time scale we look at. But if we can just drop it from 300 to 200, remember, we're not being very ambitious, 300 to 200. We can shift time back by 10 years. And if we can drop it from, from 200 to 100, we can buy ourselves another 20 years to get into steady state. So you can look at it at cleaning up the water we're shipping south, trying to get rid of the salts, which is extraordinarily difficult from the Tulare Basin, that's closed basin. We don't even have the San Joaquin River to dump them into. Um, or shifting time and keep buying us time to, to get into steady state. Well, what about this canal business? These are the numbers that Bill came up with. This is the daily tonnage of salt shipped out when you meet export requirements for the past 20 years. Bill can give you the exact date. It was a 20-year period. And this is the size of canal. If we run them through the delta, remember the scheme we've currently got, which is contaminate the water as much as possible before sending it south to, 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 <laughs> to the valley and, and, and L.A. We ship that out daily, 5,400 tons of salt. If we build a tiny, tiny canal for urban use only, we can still drop it by 1,000 tons a day, 1,000 tons a day. If we... Now, note, of course, this is nonlinear, as we'd expect. If we, if we build a moderate-sized canal, 7.5 thousand CFS capacity, we drop it from 5,400 to 3,700. And if we multiply this by the days, we're, um, I'm going to make this number up. You can check me later. It's right around 600,000 tons of salt reduction export. Now, this, is, this, this model was run, and Bill can correct me. This was run with a mixture of a little bit of through delta when we can do it and getting it through the canal when we, when we, can, when we can take it out of hood without violating a flow rate in the Sacramento River, which I think was pegged at, was it, is this a 10,000 or 10,000 CFS flow? And, of course, here comes the nonlinearity of the canal capacity because we can double capacity from 7.5K to 15K and just get a relatively small increase, very small increase, in the ability to, to export water. And of, uh, consequently, extremely small increase in, in the, um, the reduction. But, but here's another interesting thing, that the three studies we have estimate and, and the back of the envelope water qualities know that we're shipping 500,000 tons down there. And we can cut that back by 600. Now, remember, this is a net accumulation down there because we're shipping many more tons in, and then, as we're well aware, a bunch is coming out with the San Joaquin River. So it's the net accumulation is 500,000 tons. The total import is about 1.2 million or something like that. But if we can reduce our net import by 600,000, then as an economist, I can sort of think about that and say, wow, you know, that sort of balances out. Now, I know, of course, that's not true hydrologically. But people who worry about the salt in the – here's the take-home message. If you're worried about salt in the Central Valley, think of peripheral canal. Um, this is a bit weird, but it's true. 
Um, so here we go. Uh, jobs and money. Looking at money, um, 7.5, uh, if we multiply all these effects of animals and crops and processing through, through the system, we can, we can get costs up to 850 million a year in 2030, total costs. This would be the savings in terms of quality savings from a medium-sized peripheral canal. If we're looking at jobs, we're looking at 22,000. So the surprising thing to us was how big these numbers really are. Now, I think we're probably, if anything, on the high side. So I take these numbers with a grain of salt. But remember, we haven't even added in the urban numbers yet. And we saw in the previous talk that they're equally as high. The point about it is that there are lots of limitations to this study and lots of caveats and lots of cautions, particularly the link that we're currently working on between the perched salt water and the cropping pattern. How effectively can farmers offset that? Secondly, there's this tremendous variation in spatial variability of salts and impacts. And we've just taken a broad brush. Thirdly, we've extrapolated these three studies to the whole valley. And so you have to be always cautious about extrapolation. And but, and, and we might have got our predictions of cropping patterns wrong. What we do know is that certainly even allowing for these caveats, the numbers are still, the quality component is a substantial factor. And that the other thing would be interesting is that, that economists tend to look at, at unintended consequences. And so if one has a canal, and if it gets financed the way it's going to have to be financed, which is those commercial users who use the water to make money have to pay a proportion of it, it's going to increase the cost of water in the Central Valley, no question. And what's that going to do to the cropping pattern and the drainage? It's going to also cut back drainage. And so we'll get a double whammy. We will, we will import much cleaner water with a reduction of salt load, and we will also put an incentive structure, again, with a lot of complaining, of course, in place that will encourage conservation and minimize drainage flows, which will further reduce um, the accumulation of salts in these shallow groundwaters. So we're looking at substantial quantities of money in the future if we don't do this, or if we do it, we can save it. Even the small facility a very small facility can make a substantial difference. And a medium-sized facility uh, can offer substantial quality benefits. And so there we are, questions. Just wanted to, to add, Richard, that you, know, you said you think maybe the numbers are a little bit high, but, but in contrast to the the water, the drinking water study that we just heard about, you're, you're not actually factoring in sea level rise. So no. from that perspective, it's probably conservative, right, in terms of the, the salinity impacts. Right? Thank you for pointing that out. We, Bill's, Bill's model ran with the standard sea level rise. It, it, it's, it's not in there yet. Yes. Did you take into account at all with the cleaner water leaching of the soil or the salts in the soils? In as much with cleaner water, we'd get actually more uptake of salt as they went through the same level of strata of, of soils, old marine soils on the west side. No, I didn't. And, and so what you're saying is you put cleaner water in, but you still get as much as, as much salt in, in the drainage. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, that's certainly possible. But we were only actually looking from a, a plant's perspective, um, and we, we didn't calculate the increased load. But, but you should also have less application of water for leaching. Exactly. So, we're, we're, yeah. the, the, so that might offset it. Works out yet. 
I, I think it quite likely that given um, if we are even cutting the ag contractors a break on the cost of a peripheral canal, it's, it's, still, going to, it's still going to add a, a hundred bucks an acre foot or something like that. I mean, a, a, a seventy or eighty dollars an acre foot to to the water costs um, for that proportion of water that comes through it, and um, that in of itself will be a substantial incentive to adopt um, lower drainage generating technologies and methods. If you want to have a look at the possible effect of this, just have a look at the Shoup and Hotman's uh, PNAS paper, and you'll see that during the drought, and we'll see this this year, I'll forecast that, that 2009 will be a really low drainage year. Why? Because the current price of water in Westlands Water District is running 300 bucks an acre foot. And you're going to put that stuff on very carefully. Um, and so this, what we're going to see in 2009 because of the restrictions is, is a little preview of how we're going to be operating every year in 20 years' time, perhaps. So we have a double effect. There will be the, the, the scarcity cost and the real money cost of water effect on drainage. And then there will be the quality of the water itself, which will be less lower leaching fractions. No, I, I liked your characterization of what that you're managing evapotranspiration, and I've spent a fair amount of time making evapotranspiration measurements. So I'm assuming that the crops that you're talking about use somewhere between three and five feet yes. of water per year, and if you were able then to use less water because you didn't have to flush the salts out, have you done some estimates as to how much water you would also save? in the Central Valley by uh, going with a lower salinity water as an application water? Not yet, although we, we have done a climate change study in which, of course, with the increased temperatures that we are anticipating, you actually get a slight increase in evapotranspiration per unit area. And, and, and actually, we've, we've shown that the crop yield goes, goes up because of technological change and, and ET. The water use per acre actually goes up also, but not, not as much as the crop. And so the water use per ton of crop grown goes down. But we've got to be very careful because we, we always think of per acre. And then if you start, if you, if you look at the rates of technological progress in terms of yield per acre and yield per unit water, um, that's also got to be figured in. But you do have the opportunity to change the amount of water that is actually going to go into E versus T versus uh, drainage. Absolutely. Um, uh, the far I'm confident that the farmers being smart operators and businessmen, when they see both the scarcity cost and the fiscal cost of, of, of this water, um, um, will, will definitely do that. They've done it in previous droughts and in, and in the 09 drought, which we're definitely going to be facing regardless of the rain. Uh, they will do it again. They won't be happy. They won't like it, but they'll do it. Um, I had a question that relates to um, the nature of your interaction with the various communities that you're sort of characterizing in this model. In the last presentation, I got a good sense that there was a lot of conversation between your research team and the treatment operators, the, the treatment plant operators. It sounded like you went directly to them for a lot of your characterizations and sort of reality check. Um, could you characterize how you did that with your study? Are you, are you working with that kind of relationship with the producers and the growers and, and that kind of thing, or are these reported numbers mostly? Uh, mostly reported numbers. We did um, in the Water Resources Control Board study do a primary survey of around um, 700 people in the valley. Mainly we were asking them how they felt about salinity, how salinity affected their households, how salinity affected their lives, what it, and we actually asked them what would you pay, what would you pay to um, have salinity improved in the valley, and the answer was $4.70 per, per person per month, um, if you want to know <laughs> what it is. Um, uh, um, but um, we, 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 did it, we did an extensive primary survey, of a uh, male survey of, of um, people for that, and that's published in the, in the other report. In terms of we did not go out um, to the water districts and say, if, if you got cleaner water and if you were charged more for it, how would you change your operations? 
Um, I'm, I'm more of a believer of seeing people, what people um, uh, do do rather than, than, than what they say they'll do. You know, I mean, we, we've all got, I had a phone call last night asking me to subscribe for the nth time to a charity, and, you know, I said, uh, and it's always when you're trying to cook dinner. Um, and I, I said, oh, yeah, 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 okay, we're doing it. We do it by mail. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the, I gave it the office re reply. Just clarify for me the um, you described um, the, in, in the description of the uh, the database, the GIS database with the fields and the practices. Mm -hmm. And um, could you clarify for me the the period of time on which that that empirical model of of response of cropping to to changing salinity was built? Or was well, it, it, it's it's built from from ninety nine to 2004 in terms of our, our database. Okay. Um, but the actual response is a cross-section response because what we wanted to do was statistically break out the effect of farmers um, on salt. And so we wanted to, to, to shake out the effects of changes in price, changes in technology, changes. We said, okay, let's just take a snapshot. And so we picked for our a corner of Kern County, mm -hmm. um, which we call CVPM 19, which we can show you. And that had 2,700 and something fields in it. So it's a decent sample. Mm -hmm. and, and, we, and we broke them into different salinity slices. We actually ended up with 30 different salinity slices, different numbers of fields and different. And then we looked at the cropping pattern. And we said, uh, and we compared it to the a time series for the whole county of the riskiness of the cropping. And we said, farmers, I believe farmers are like Wall Street, no, they're better than Wall Street managers. Um, they have portfolios and they have portfolios in real things instead of imaginary instruments that don't have any backing. Um, and they run a portfolio of crops. And, and you'll go to any farm business and they won't be just all in lettuce or all in pistachios or all in alfalfa. They have a portfolio. And that portfolio is for various reasons, one of which is to offset the risk of price and yields. And some years are good for some crops and so on and so forth. So we took that and we said, if a person changes their portfolio, they must be expecting, if the risk is constant, the risk is not a function, price risk and yield risk is not a function of salt, they must be expecting a lower average yield. So what yield loss would induce the people to go out of high-value crops more and more and more into low-value crops? And we saw at some of the high levels um, that the high-value crops are driven out completely. The classic example is a study done on, on Broadview Irrigation District when they had their drains blocked up for a 15-year period. And the cropping pattern that used to heavily depend for money on the growth of processing tomatoes, tomatoes went out completely during that time. And then they unblocked the drains because of the change in the law, and guess what? Tomatoes walked back into Broadview. And then they got blocked up again, and they've walked out again. And, and so... Um, we used the pattern of crops to tell us, and, we, and, and the interesting thing is that, that farmers, we looked at the marginal probability of observing a crop in a salt zone, and that changed just as if the farmers had come up and talked to the theoretical salinity people in Davis and said, tell me how sensitive are these crops? And they'd been given the list of sensitivity and gone back, and no, no, these guys had figured it out for themselves. That's real observations. So, so, so we th – anyhow, that's a long answer. I understand answer. it a lot better. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question about your one table. I want to make sure I understand it correctly. But when you looked at the, the loss by 2030, I think, using yeah. various water supplies, and then it doesn't go down to zero. It goes down to like $100 million a year. Sure. And, and so does that mean, I mean, make sure I understand it correctly, does that mean that there's, 
there's still some salination, yeah. This of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. So, you, so even if you go to Sacramento River water, you still have a, a sure, salt we got, problem. We still, we still got, we still got 3.7 million acre feet with 100 parts per million going south, and you still got salt accumulating. If you believe the Orlob study and the Shoops and the Hartman study, and if you don't improve conditions on the San Joaquin and you still let the San Joaquin remove the level of salts that's moving now, because that's really the only outlet. Then you have to say the net accumulation, net accumulation is, is 500,000 a year, mm -hmm. and we could offset quite a large proportion of that with a canal. But we've still got salts going down there because we've still got losses because, and, mm -hmm. and we've still got um, a salt problem because of the mobilization of salts that come from the upslope, upslope um, subsurface marine soils down into the, into the trough, as it's called. So, I mean, do you eventually get to a sustainable situation? You said steady state. What do you we, mean by steady state? We, we, we can get, I believe, and this is another thing that I've changed my mind on, I believe we can get to a steady state irrigated agriculture um, through two broad effects. One is to downsize the acreage, the, uh, uh, and, and th that will either happen forcibly by salinization or voluntarily uh, by economics or environmental buyouts or something, and improve, the, if we, and, and improve the quality of the water being imported into the valley such that the net increase in salt burden is greatly reduced or, or perhaps eliminated. Now, these numbers, we very crude initial numbers suggest that that's feasible if we have an alternative delivery system. Uh, under those circumstances, the net, we are able to net say, say, that doesn't mean to say we won't still get accumulation because we've still got those marine subsurface layers um, up on, on, on the benches on the um, west side, and that's great soil. It will continue to be irrigated and we will continue to get movement of salts, and there's a big reservoir of salt movement there, which I think will continue to build up. Mm -hmm. But there's hope, and it's not in the direction of, interestingly enough, it, it, it doesn't require um, an additional drain. We've got to still use the San Joaquin River as the existing drain, mm -hmm. but um, maybe we can put more water into San Joaquin and do the dilution solution. So, Richard, uh that discussion has to do with the, uh, the San Joaquin Valley as opposed to the Tulare Basin. Yes. The Tulare, as I understand it, is really a closed basin. And so we have to have alternate salt, and we have alternate salt removal systems there. And, and they will have to be, of course, evaporative ponds, stockpiling, um, and uh, we'll build another um, theme park with Salt Mountain. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Richard, I just want oh. to raise a dilemma for you. So, you know, you mentioned how this was one of our surprising findings, and at one point in the report, we talk about this as it's kind of a windfall. Um, but both the the water quality, the water treatment savings for drinking water, but also these, these savings for, for agriculture. And, it, and we actually suggest as one, one of the sort of, to look at this as one of the possible ways to help finance, say, ecosystem mm -hmm. um, investments in the, in, in the Delta. And in the case of drinking water quality, you can think about this as a, it's pretty straightforward to figure out how to charge people because you could just do a per acre yeah. foot kind of fee. But in, in this case, Given the maps that you showed us and, you know, the discussion about these slopes and drainage and everything, it, it, I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be a lot more complicated. I just wonder if you have any thoughts about how one might go about figuring out a, a way to charge farmers for, for this windfall. Well, one, 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 one way which might be simpler than trying to reduce it to dollar terms would be to, to go back and say, okay, um, how much less water will you be applying because the change in the leaching fraction and, and – so on. And if this land goes out of production, instead of pouring the water back in, 
in, in, into the existing regions. That water has to go back into the San Joaquin River. Um, and I haven't done any calculations yet, but if that water went to or some other environmental purpose, but if you put it in the San Joaquin River, you could, in fact, I think, internalize it by pointing out to the farmers that the San Joaquin River is their only salt removal mechanism that's legally and politically available to them at the minute. And that if they, and, and currently, um, one of my colleagues, two of my colleagues, Peter and Bill, and maybe some of the rest, want to see the salmon runs restored on the San Joaquin. And there's no question we need more water in the San Joaquin. We're going to have more water. But if we have more water and we can still improve the quality, so you would say the salt load stays constant. That can't be increased. But, but the addition, any water savings goes towards improving the quality of an environmental amenity. And if it's an environmental amenity that enables farmers to meet the environmental standards more cheaply, that would have some positive incentive for them rather than a tax and a negative incentive. So, so what I would do is actually I would, I would try and hit the urbans up for all that money I can calculate that they're saving. And for the ags, I wouldn't try and get into the money business. I'd try and get into the water business and try and move that water either not being diverted from – it wouldn't be diverted from southern delta. We'd leave it in delta or in, in the San Joaquin, whichever. And, and I, think, I think we could sort of work towards doing that calculation, but we haven't done it yet. Okay? Thanks a lot. We're on time. <laughs>